Hello everybody, welcome back. Today I'm going to make the case that Classic Game Room was the best retro video game show in the history of YouTube. But to balance things out, I'm also going to go over some of the controversies that involved the channel and why some people disliked it or grew to dislike it. So it's going to be a very interesting conversation, so let's get on to it. For those of you who aren't familiar with Classic Game Room or just need a refresher, here's a condensed history of it. It originally started in 1999 with two guys, Mark Bustler and David Crozen. At that time, it was hosted on an internet site. That show lasted for two years, ending in the year 2000. From then on, David went into pharmaceuticals, but Mark went on to make documentaries. In 2008, Mark had a slowdown in the documentary work so he wanted to do some stuff on the side, and one of the things he did was start a YouTube channel, and leveraging the editing equipment that he had for the documentaries, he started making game reviews, similar to the ones he had produced before. The show was a surprise hit, and it continued to grow over the years. In 2010, it got so big that he launched a spin-off channel called CGR Undertow. And that was followed by other side channels that would come in the next couple of years, including one that showed game trailers, another that showed the news, another about pinball, another about toys, and so forth. He also hired other people, including some who did reviews on the Undertow channel, including one person who kind of became famous on the channel named Derek. But in 2013, bad things started to happen. That's when YouTube got really crazy about copyrights and they also updated their algorithm. As a result, a lot of the videos on Classic Game Room started to get flagged for copyright, including many of their old ones. And also the videos became less recommended to people. So they started to lose a lot of views and as a result they lost a lot of revenue. In 2013, they had enough with it, they stopped producing videos for YouTube and instead went to Daily Motion and posted the reviews there. What I did was I pulled the show off of YouTube in 2013 after um, their automated copyright system came through and just between my channel at the time we were still growing the CGR undertow channel I mean it just it just cleared out almost all of our high-end high-earning videos with the high-earning videos all paid for the like the weird Atari ones and stuff but hardly any of the fans came over to watch the videos on daily motion So they reversed course and brought the show back to YouTube in 2014. In 2015, things were still going bad, so they decided to discontinue many of the side channels, including the Undertow channel. It's been a blast. It's been my pleasure to make videos for you guys. And, um, yeah. So anyway, um... And Mark also scaled back the main channel, saying it was only going to be a part-time job for him because he decided to do writing and filmmaking on the side. In 2016, he further tried to salvage the channel by doing a major Patreon push. He would continue to post videos on YouTube, but he would do longer versions of those videos exclusively on Patreon. Much like the Daily Motion thing, he quickly relented and stopped doing the exclusives on Patreon. But things continued to crumble. On December 19th, 2017, he posted a review of Vector Man 2. From what I can see, this was the final full-length review of a game on his YouTube channel. That was pretty much the end of the Classic Game Room show on YouTube. He continued to post a lot of other things on his channel and some of the other side channels, but none of it was like it had been before, and a lot of it veered away from video games altogether. But in 2018, he made a last-ditch effort to save the show by doing a season of it on Amazon Prime. They were long episodes, but he only did it for a year and he stopped doing it after that. From what I can see, the last full-length game review he ever posted was on Amazon Prime on September 12th, 2018, and that was for the game Defender. Today, when you go to his channel and check out the newest stuff, it's mainly comic book reviews and a few podcasts he's done here and there. His view count on his main channel stands at 498 million, with 433,000 subs still there. The Undertow channel, which was the second most popular, has 140 million views and 176,000 subs. The show left a big impression on a large group of people. If you go to some of his recent videos, you'll see a lot of people begging him to bring back the show. But I did a lot of research on this and 
he has said again and again that he's not going to bring back the show. There's even a message posted on his website that says he's not going to bring back the show. But I do want to go over my reasons why I think it was the best show. The first thing I have written down is he had a good voice. Period. I mean, his voice was buttery smooth and it was very relaxing to listen to. From Callisto and Activision, yes, I've seen Downton Abbey. My wife enjoyed it and I like to watch for Lady Sybil. Frankly, I was disappointed they didn't bring her back as a hot zombie. Even if n you've never seen one of his videos before, go and listen to some of them. I think he's naturally gifted at it, but I also think he crafted a, a voice from the documentaries that he used to do, and he just got good at it. I wish my voice was as good as his. He says things that no one else would ever think to say. Fans know exactly what I'm talking about. He will start off reviewing a game and then a minute later he's talking about potato chips or something. He has this vivid but convincing imagination. You want that? You want the creamy kind of coleslaw. And and maybe that's what gives the Yars so much energy to continue their vengeance time and time and time again cuz that that like I said the game has infinite replay value. He has a very unique outlook on life. The thing is that I I found a used Sega Saturn for $40, and I'll be picking that up later today, so I don't see how I can be expected to get anything done. I mean, how could you? Is a tree as much of a tree when I don't have a Sega Saturn? But at the same time, he seems like an average guy, the guy you would want to come over to play some games with, or somebody you would want to hang out in a bar or something. He's a really, a very relaxing person to watch on YouTube. I mean, he gets a little crazy sometimes, but for the most part, uh, he's a calming presence. He's not like a high energy TikToker or anything like that. He's like the opposite of that. And for a lot of people, that's a good thing. He's also an everyman because he's kind of the same age as a lot of retro gamers. He was born in 1975, which happens to be the same year I was born. I know a lot of retro gamers aren't that old, but uh, he does speak for the older crowd, probably more so than anyone else on YouTube. He has some of the same shared experiences that a lot of us older gamers have. It's fun to listen to somebody that has those same experiences. Another thing that I personally liked is that he had ongoing gags, repeat jokes that he would use again and again. He joked about flamethrowers a lot, how he loves them, and how he wishes every game had them and so forth. He talked about Truxton a lot. The game Cosmic Carnage for the 32X. He talked about his hatred for Jar Jar Binks a lot. I bring you the review of Star Wars Super Bombad Racing, where you can race as Obi-Wan Kenobi, Darth Maul, Yoda, and this guy. Oh dear, so Jonathan from Irvine, California sent me a game with Jar Jar Binks in it. John, that's punishable in many parts of the galaxy by having an arm chopped off with a lightsaber. But that's okay, you said all hail Lord Carnage in your letter which spares your arms, although you may be frozen in carbonite later. Here's the big one though. I loved his review style. He doesn't do this in-depth analysis of the graphics and sound. I mean, he does touch on those things sometimes. But like I said, he could start talking about the game and then all of a sudden start talking about potato chips or something. You just never know where he's going to go in the review. But he still gives you a great idea of how the game is. And a lot of times it's just him enjoying the game and he can make the most unpleasing game to look at fun because the way he interacts with it and the things he says about it. His reviews do not seem to be scripted, but sometimes it's hard to tell. It could just be bullet pointed or something. There's definitely fewer words in his reviews compared to other people, compared to me. I think it makes it more easy to absorb and easier to enjoy. A lot of times you don't need a critical analysis when you see a person playing a game and they're interacting with it. You can tell whether they're having fun or not. I think that's something that's lost with today's reviewers. Next thing on my list is his output. In the channel's prime, he was outputting more videos than any other retro YouTuber that I know of. Even today, I can't imagine someone doing as many videos as he did. Especially when he launched CGR Undertow, they would post many, many reviews every single week. It's nice to be subscribed to a channel that launches that many game reviews. 
even though they're simple and they're not very long, it was fun to watch them all because it was great for collecting purposes. You got to see a lot of different games every single week. I couldn't come up with a figure for how many game reviews he has posted. Because he's posted so many non-gaming videos recently, it's kind of inflated the number, but the total has to be in the thousands, especially when you uh, include CGR Undertow's numbers in that. If anyone has a definitive number, let me know. I wasn't able to find any in my research. And my final point is that he covered everything, every system. At the beginning of most of his episodes, he would say the goal of the channel is to review everything. And um, he came close to doing that, I think. He would review games for all the Atari systems, all the Nintendo systems, all the Sega systems. He would post modern reviews. I think for a while, CGR Undertow was reviewing every new release. And that was during the Xbox 360 era and the PS3 era. It was very enjoyable to have a channel that covered so much and had appreciation for so many different systems. And you can tell that he loved the old games as much as the new games. In return, we did too. Now I'm going to list some things that people hated about the show. One of the main ones is Mark went into too many different directions, especially when he was attempting to solve the issues he had with YouTube demonetizing his videos and stuff like that. I will say I did a lot of research. Mark actually had to take down a lot of videos, especially ones that featured sports games for some reason. So that's something to keep in mind. But some of the other things he did to help resolve the issues, he basically jolted a lot of people by moving to Daily Motion early on in order to not do YouTube anymore. Like I mentioned before, the people did not follow him there. A lot of people said that he didn't really advertise it that well and didn't do enough to bring the people over. Honestly, no matter how much convincing you do, I think there's going to be a large group of people who don't want to go to a second platform to watch videos. But also there was that big Patreon push where he had the regular long form content locked behind a paywall. People did not like that and uh, I can understand why. There's a lot of YouTubers who use Patreon including myself, but the way he tried to utilize it was a little bit different in that he would lock most of his content behind it. Abandoning the YouTube ship altogether was too drastic a solution in a lot of people's opinion. People think maybe he should have uh, tried to work around the copyright like a lot of YouTubers do today. Of course, back then when you had copyright issues, there wasn't as many solutions available to you. People also don't like how weird his videos got, especially after the reviews stopped. He does a lot of different things. He does comic book reviews now. Uh, he has a podcast on there that occasionally gets posted. He does a lot of weird shorts, which shows segments of video games and stuff. People think he's abusing the subscriber base that he already has because they didn't subscribe to see all that stuff. They subscribed uh, for the game reviews, mostly. Another complaint people have is his review style. I said it was a good thing, but some people just were turned off by it. They didn't like the lack of details. They don't like how he had a, a lot of irrelevant commentary in those reviews because people want to learn a lot about those games. I would say that this complaint is more solid on the reviews of more recent games, but when you're reviewing an Atari 2600 game, there's not much you can analyze about it. Some people just prefer a different review style, and I understand that. Uh, people have different tastes. People also complained about the ongoing gags that he would do. He talked about Truxton too much. He talked about flamethrowers too much. He also did this gag a lot where he would place the game in the wrong system. Unfortunately, what it does not do is allow you to play Sega 32X games on your GameCube and that's well, that's disappointing. Once again, it's a matter of taste. I personally enjoyed those things. People also disliked how he pushed a lot of his merchandise through his channel, and he still does this today. He's always trying to sell books and comics and stuff like that. But even in the past, during the heyday, he was pushing a lot of t-shirts and mugs and stuff like that. A lot of his videos began with a push. The following review has been approved by the Best of Classic Game Room Special Edition Laser Hypervision Album Set. I think he was 
good at blending those pushes into his videos, but I can see why it turned off a lot of people. Here's a big one. He once had a website where people could post reviews. Also, he would have his merchandise on there, and he would also post links to his own reviews on there. But one day, he redesigned the website and deleted all the user reviews off the site and that irked a lot of people obviously i if i had gone on there and reviewed 100 games and he all of a sudden deleted it i would not have liked that as well he still has the website to this day but it doesn't have that stuff on it obviously another thing he did was he sold his collection apparently or at least a very large portion of it a lot of people donated the games uh, for him to review and they even donated systems he had this little map showing the location of whoever sent the item in. Over time those pins just accumulated so much that he could barely push a pin into certain parts of the US. I think I'll defend Mark on this a little bit. I don't think we should force him to have to hold on to all that stuff forever because it would have been thousands of items. When you donate an item to a show you can't expect someone to keep that forever storage becomes an issue some people have wanted to donate items to me and i have said no so far because i feel like down the road i might have to sell my collection and i would have to sell their stuff too i think it is heartbreaking to see him sell his collection though because that means he's stepping away from video games basically at least uh the excessive video game stuff that he used to do so i can understand why people would be sad about that my last point in the list deals with sadness, and that is, I think people dislike cl Classic Game Room because it ended. And when it ended, that was sad, and people are just sad about it in general. If you go watch the last video on the CGR Undertow channel, it's called The Last One Ever. It's so depressing, I can't even watch the whole thing. I said in a previous video that when Sega left the system making market that we all lost something. I also think when Classic Game Room failed, we all lost something. If it would have been able to work through its problems and stay profitable, I think the whole landscape of retro gaming would have been different. Um, so. I want to finish with a thought experiment. Mark has said over and over again he's not going to bring back Classic Game Room. From everything I've heard from him, he in general hates YouTube and I don't think he would want to do a real in-depth endeavor using YouTube anymore. But if it were to come back, I have some suggestions on how to make it profitable and to make it successful this time around. I went back to a lot of his older reviews and saw that a lot of them are actually pretty short, six, seven, eight minutes. With at least eight minute videos, that would be good because if you have eight minute videos, you can actually put a commercial in the middle of the video and it would make things a little bit more profitable. I'm not sure if commercials in the middle of the video were even an option when he was first having problems with YouTube, but of course, if he came back, he would have that benefit. Also, he can redo the Patreon push, but just utilize it effectively, give people early access, do some bonus behind the scenes videos or something like that. I think there is an audience still out there for him, and I think he knows that. And if he did a well-advertised Patreon push to bring back the channel, I think there would be some people that would do that, and I think I would be one of them. And I think the first video he should make is a review of Truxton. I think a lot of people will be talking about his channel again, if he were to do that. It's all about renewing the attention you once had, and I think he still has avenues to do that. Along with that, I think he should do some kind of crowdfunding option. Just say, hey, the show's coming back, and if I raise $50,000 or something, I'll restart it, and you'll get me back. Make a stretch goal if you reach 100000 uh, that you would bring back Derek. Mark combined with Derek would be enough to bring people back. 
I know Derek may not want to come back because from what I read, he works at a university now and he has a really good job where he's in charge of their social media. What do you guys think? Is Classic Game Room still viable today if it were to start producing again? And share with me the thoughts you had about the channel back then and what you think about it in hindsight. I enjoyed doing this video and I hope you enjoyed watching it. I did a similar commentary video about the Dreamcast, about why I play it more than any of my other game systems. The link to it is on the screen right there. May your games make you happy and smart, and may people respect you for playing them. So long everybody.